Welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we can sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fantastic things that we found going on in the world of Linux. I'm Vin Stone. That's Joel Bright. Mm -hmm. And that is a perfect Pedro Mateus with his kitty cat ears. <laughs> it's a bold Ow. move. Takes a brave man. <laughs> 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 What's up, beautiful people? Um, everybody's safe, sound, um, still doing the things. Everybody seems to be in one piece. I know everyone's stuck at home. But mm -hmm. hopefully much. we can offer you a little bit of an escape from that for a few minutes. I know yeah. for the past couple of days, I've been fighting with the Adore, which is the DAW software that we use to record this show on Linux after years. I think uh, Adore 5.3 came out in 2017, so it's been a minute. Uh, mm. Paul has released um, Adore 6 Pre-1 to anybody who backs the project and... I think you can just get it from the GitHub, but you can't get a particular version to do. But this is a debug build. I tried to get it up and running to test it in production. I got it up and running to a point to a point where it just laughed at me and started crashing and locking. So I was like, no, no, we're done with that. <laughs> but I did try. I did try with that hot mess of no business. I, I look forward to playing with it in the future. Uh, another thing we did Friday, Pedro, we did something. You knew. Yes. We had a party. We, uh... Got some mm -hmm. uh, Meet the Freemans into Black Mesa. That's what it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for Yay. some reason, my brain was screaming Project Borealis, but no, 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 that's <laughs> the other one. <laughs> that was good. We'll fun. get to that at some yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> We're playing around with the Black Mesa crew. Cool. Moving we'll back this Friday. Uh, when did we do it? 6 p.m.? Uh, it was around 6, so it'd be 10. Yeah, it, yeah, was, it was uh four. earlier yeah. than your usual yeah. streams, yes. It was six PM. <laughs> I, <laughs> so if you want to come and hang out and play a little bit of that, uh probably hammer on it again this Friday. I will post a message in our Discord. All you need is Black Mesa. Right now you have to run it on Proton. Uh, I've already chatted with the developer. There's a fix in the works on that. And uh you'll need the workshop mod, the Black Mesa Coop. Then you won't have to do anything on your end to be able to join the game. But it's kind of fun. It's multiplayer Half-Life 1. So come yep. check that out. What have you <laughs> been up to, Jill? Oh, boy. So yesterday I had fun again on Linux Unplugged. That's always a lot of fun. And this time I ended up spending probably over an hour just talking to their uh, to the um, Jupiter Broadcasting community after the show. And that's always a lot of fun, you know, getting to know even more of the Linux community. It's great. And it was a really, really fun show and a, a good... Uh, good chance to you know do something fun but i unfortunately did miss pedro's stream because of it <laughs> Aww. it's just dark souls <laughs> i yeah. get that it won't be everyone's cup of tea so <laughs> Aww. speaking of dark souls what have you been up to pedro well uh, yesterday i streamed more of that managed to get all the way through blight town without mm -hmm. dying I only died when I tried to help someone else beat uh, Quilag, so there's that. But I died okay. in someone else's world, so it doesn't count. I have very limited Dark Souls experience. I know enough of it that I don't like it, but I can watch somebody <laughs> play it. I am capable of appreciating someone else's joy in something that I was like, I don't care about this thing. Is that a particularly difficult part of the game? Uh, the, yes, Blight Town is like the worst because it... The original one and the original game, the frame rate used to tank, mm -hmm. like, really badly. Even on the consoles, uh, you would get, like, 15 FPS if you were lucky. Mm -hmm. And it's dark, it's hard to see, you die a lot, and there are these um, ginormous pricks, off in the distance, all clad in black, that shoot uh, toxic darts at you. Mm. So, yeah, no, it's that whole area is just... Nope. In Basically a can. sounds like every <laughs> rave I went to in the 90s. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> That's cool. I tuned in. I saw that you were fighting um, the big giant spider from Lord of the Rings. And I was like, all right, have fun with that. And <laughs> it, it's the, the bottom is the spider. And then the top half is l naked lady. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever floats your boat, man. So let's get into mm -hmm. it. We got some exciting news. Something that is going to put an end to all the hate between the projects. Uh -huh. <laughs> they finally merged, and I am talking about K. The gnome is silent. It is the 
Cape oh, Project. is that how you pronounce it? Yes, okay. uh, it is actually that. <laughs> this is from the Gnome Project. They wanted to make sure because, you know, it's spelled K-N-O-M-E. And, you know, the immediacy of now. Best of both, both worlds, man. Katie and Gnome merged together in one project, but they wanted to make sure that you knew that the K was, in fact, silent. Wait, no, it's the Gnome, so it's just K. <laughs> yeah. That's going to get confusing coming on in the future. Man. Yes. But yeah. what do they say about it, man? Uh, now is the moment immediately happening. That's why K will be your desktop now or sometime next week. The state of art user experience, da da da. It's pretty awesome, man. I mean, mixing the flexibility and customization of GNOME paired with the stability of KDE. It's going to be Can awesome. we have it the other way around, please? Nope. Yeah. Yes. You can't, man. Uh, this combination, expertise of uh, both the GNOME and KDE developers, they've managed to reduce the number of bugs to effectively zero. Oh, end. taking pot shots at Microsoft with the uh, Dude, black, I mean, uh, blue screen of death look this, alike. This, it's coming to mobile, too. Very excited to try this. Uh, I think it's going to be pretty awesome. Yeah. It yeah, looks I think the, it was the, the animated user. GIF as a button that sold it for me. Mm. Yeah. The user interface does look beautiful. And truth be told, you can, uh, Kate, both KDE and GNOME, you can kind of make them look like each other. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it but works. Uh, since it, they're it going. Works. <laughs> Since they're going with the uh, customization of GNOME, that screenshot yes. of that layout is literally all you get. And until the third party tools are developed <laughs> to allow you to change it, you can't do anything about it. Yeah. I was uh, going to call uh, BS uh, and XKCD 927 on this, but then I read the um, the agreement from the uh, KDE person. It's like mm -hmm. a joint conference was only the beginning. K, G, uh, or <laughs> QTK3. Yes. Uh, K Mobile and Lolly Rock. It's like, oh, so they're going the full thing. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Get it? Synergy. It's funny. It's brilliant. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> we're just going to keep saying K. Okay. K. 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 Other news Linux 5.6 is Aljo. Yeah, this is really exciting. Um, you know, despite what's going on in the world, we still have a new release. Awesome. And one of the reasons is, of course, is because Linus is the social distancing champ who championed working at home and online. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. And so as we talked about in January, this release sees the inclusion of the loved WireGuard VPN, which is really, really cool. And what? Linux kernel update would be without more software, uh, more software and hardware support, including early support of USB 4 and support for this is really cool support for the MX Master 3 mouse and other wireless Logitech products, which many of us do have. So that it was really Ooh. cool. And even more support for AMD GPUs, NVIDIA GPUs, and Intel Tiger Lake chipsets. Mm. And actually, this the ne the last one I want to mention, which is a real big deal, honestly, is the improvements in AMD Zen temperature power reporting. I know there were some issues with that. Oh, so. it took them a while. <laughs> it took them a while. Yeah. It always does take a minute. I was. Yes. This is going to be the first release that we've seen with kernel level XFAT support. Mm -hmm. That's cool. You know, and I'm like, hey, that's been a month, it's but now it's inside wonderful. the kernel. Don't have to worry about it. Boom, just get it done. ButterFS now has a discard async, which is going to group together you're like and scheduling all of your trims so you don't have to set up like a trim schedule anymore. And yep. that's great. But I mean, did you really have to worry about that running ButterFS? I mean, the file system probably knackered itself already. So mm. by the time you would need to run. <laughs> well, if you're a Strider, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Aww. that's the thing. There has been a regression fix for the CH341 uh, with the line speed with USB. And you're like, wait a minute. Was that why my USB device is running slow? Yes, it was. So that's taken care of. And Pedro. What happens if you have well, an Intel wireless card? If you have cool. an Intel wireless card released at any point over the past five years, mm. um, you may have experienced some issues if you mm -hmm. uh, built the kernel and started using it. Namely, uh, that you were connected, but it was dropping all of the packets. Mm. And that is because uh, in order to quell one of the security vulnerability bits, uh, they removed a certain part of the um, the Intel drivers, 
and they forgot that the MVM um, branch of IWL, which includes those cards from the last five years, mm-hmm. kind of needed that statement. Otherwise, all the packets, it would see them as though they had not been checked for keys because it literally wasn't checking for keys. So it was just dropping them all. And uh, there, I put the link to the fix uh, in the show notes. And uh, yeah, judging by the uh, the fix... There's, let's see, Intel Wireless 7260, 3160, 7265, 3165, 8260, 8260. Ultimately, at the end of the day, (laughs) at the end of the day, the beautiful thing about this, this was Intel's fault. They did it to themselves. Foot, shot, blam, but it's going to get fixed. That's not a big deal. Yay. I'm running it right now. It's already been released. Yeah. I mean, the patch is there. Uh, I haven't applied the patch because I don't have any Intel Wireless kit, but I am going to get on Jackbox. (laughs) And so the day it was released, I'm like, yeah, then I go always scroll through the comments on Reddit until I see the, oh, that means it'll be in the AUR later tomorrow, possibly. I'm like, I'm just going to download and build it. Why? Because building a kernel is fun and easy. You should do it too. It only takes a few minutes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's not <laughs> and much And I to too it. very much appreciate the uh, Logitech uh, device support for no reason at all. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> I, probably because you like it. You, you, you buy a mouse that requires drivers. It doesn't require the drivers. It's yeah. just nice to have. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. It, 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 you, you have a mouse that you can complain about and doesn't have full functionality without drivers. Okay. So I like to buy hardware that makes me work for it a little bit. <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> Gee, Pedro, I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Explain. Uh, yeah, about you're the this. one to talk. No, 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 no. no. Tell yeah. me more about this complex mystery of this mouse that's going to boggle me. <laughs> it was mostly figuring out how to store the uh, profile in the mouse itself. Mm. That's a beautiful thing. Hey, uh, we got fat support inside the kernel, but uh, one company that was like, hey, man, we sold a product that kind of did that. Uh, I'm not happy about it. Nope. Mm-hmm. Paragon software. Mm-hmm. Happy about it? Not the least. The proprietary file system vendor unleashed a 90s level torrent of FUD yesterday. Uh, this is from Jim Salter over at Ars Technica. All this in our show yeah. notes. Basically, just they're going to break down the FUD and they're like, booga booga, this is bad. Buy our stuff. Don't use now that it's built directly into Linux. And I just wanted to point this out because I thought it was old school, man. This is like late 90s, early 2000s level of Linux bad. Now you have to use our stuff or uh, you'll break things, which is completely and wholly untrue. Not yeah. that anyone watching or listening to this show is buying into any of this. I just thought we'd have a good laugh at this. And hey, man, open source is in fact here to stay. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry that you built your business model on that. Mm. Yeah, on that one particular bit of functionality that was patent protected and you were paying for the license and then reselling it at a massive, massive markup. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, no, uh, (laughs) like all the three cases that uh, they gave as to why this is um, bad, that uh, now it's open source and you shouldn't use it, is literally, it's like, please don't use the open source one, buy our proprietary implementation instead. But didn't Microsoft release? Did, they did. Uh, yeah. It was the last of the patents of that like big bunch that they did. And then people yeah. were saying, it's like, um, how about XFAT? And they released that too. Mm-hmm. And Pedro so, was like, fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, that was <laughs> by yeah, was one point thing. of contention with <laughs> that. It's like, okay, you get the benefit of that again, Microsoft. <laughs> That that's such a safety play because you know just given some time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that that other shoe is going to drop at some point. <laughs> Jill? So Yeah, so um that, that was, you know, they they were said in the article how it be, would be less secure than than their own X Fat. Yeah, right. <laughs> mm-hmm. So <laughs> <laughs> You know, you can't blame them for trying, right? This doesn't work. They tried. (laughs) They tried, yeah. I guess they had investors that they needed to appease, so... Pedro, at least they weren't trying to plug antivirus. Well, uh, to be Uh, fair, that's not only (laughs) on Symantec. uh, That's also part of uh, Luke Rawlings' Uh fault. Because uh, at first, he made a Twitter poll. It's like, should Linux users run antivirus software? 
and 42 percent said no and uh 30 uh 40 percent said it's like for email file servers and only the other 18 percent said yes what the hell's wrong with you but uh then he posed the same question to uh, a bunch of other companies like uh, Canonical, uh, Suzy, System76, Red Hat, and uh, Symantec. Uh, so Red Hat and uh, System76 replied and said, no, just follow um, good practices and make sure you're not doing things that will inevitably get you malware regardless of whatever operating system you happen to be running. But they said, no, just follow good practices. And then Symantec replied by, yes, you should buy our product. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of says it all at that point. Yeah. It's like, oh. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm writing them a paper <laughs> yeah. check for the uh, antivirus software because I'm pretending that it's like <laughs> the mid 90s. Jill, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. So, you know, the, the simple answer is, is to, to keep your system updated and only use root when absolutely necessary. Just just keep updating. And, you know, there's other really good tools out there for security, including SE Linux. And um, both uh, System76 and Red Hat had talked about that. And uh, Semantic also mentioned that IoT is an, is an issue. Well, that's an issue because usually, yes, the um, Internet of Things are usually running old and outdated software and kernels that are harder to update or impossible because of proprietary blobs, like our, our routers and whatnot. So, yeah, that is a thing, but it's it's it you can fix it easily. And uh, Pedro had a really good fix on that one. <laughs> yeah, no, the biggest security obvious. problem when it comes to <laughs> IoT is change the damn default credentials, please. Now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that hard. Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> this is the thing. At home, don't just don't install Cody. <laughs> <laughs> not unless you want to go on a list somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Be safe. Oh, yeah. speaking of blinky dribbles. Dude. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this one is um well, it's open RGB. It's exactly what it says on the tin. This is the first release. It's version 0.1. Uh, and there are some known issues right off the bat. And what open RGB does, it, it's exactly what it says on the tin. It's an open source way to control all of your RGB devices from a single bit of software, which is great. It's amazing. Probably not going to get any official support from the likes of the Corsairs, the Logitechs, the any of the other ones but it's great to have and one thing i notice is that they have mm -hmm. ooh, windows binaries it's like oh yeah you're actually putting those out immediately mm -hmm. very good because one of the things that uh, windows is currently suffering from is uh rgb software being uh or malware being passed off as uh, rgb yes. software so good Th this is good I'm not saying that I've been asked about uh, Razer's RGB Chroma on a work laptop and getting that up and running, but with people working from home a lot more nowadays, I I can see that happening. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> tell me about this. Is this uh, like blink all the things, like uh, motherboards and keyboards? Yep. Uh, and basically, if you have any kind of addressable gerbils. RGBs, yes, connected to your system, be it mice, keyboards, uh, the LEDs inside your case. Mm -hmm. uh, this, in theory, is the one unifying thing that will make them all blink as you want them to. So there are like, some with issues because well, first release. This is going to be able to work <laughs> yeah. eventually with my Threadripper motherboard, which has analog and digital RGB on it. Probably, yeah. If it's yeah. firmware accessible, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. I'll never install it. I'll be sure to avoid it. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, well, it I'm might already even work. <laughs> oh, it might, and we'll never know. <laughs> oh, I, I'm definitely looking forward to playing with this. I have lots of bling bling here in, in my room and um, enjoy it. And uh, um, what's really cool is, you know, I have been using the Open Razor driver on my older Black Widow Chroma keyboard. Uh, with and it works really really well, but it didn't work with every model of of their keyboard and mice. So this mm -hmm. looks like it's going to solve that. <laughs> so 
totally and if they can make uh, if they can figure out a way to actually make addressable rgb addressable on linux using just the one bit of software i think a lot of mm -hmm. people will actually enjoy that yeah definitely <laughs> and i will judge you loudly <laughs> <laughs> i mean my my computer case is uh below the desk mm -hmm. and the front is right up against the uh Pedro, drawers haven't here, you learned so. anything? You you have a clear. You need to put the computer case right at your desktop, right next to your head, and complain about coil wine. <laughs> yes, I can hear the coil wine even with it being down there. Sometimes, I know, yeah. I know, but you you gotta, you gotta be like a real gamer pro, man. Just put it right there on the desk. Come on, so you can look at it. <laughs> no, I have El Cheapo for that. Fine. It's even got the tempered glass uh, side panel. Sometimes I turn it on just to see all the LEDs. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of weird, man, because then, like, look under the desk now. I installed a desk, by the way. That's what I was wiring for, like, five days straight. And, yeah, I have, like, side panels on both of these cases. Like, yeah, okay, that's neat. Um, don't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's the thing. Uh, what do Aww. we have left? Oh, we got a couple more things. Uh, two more little yeah. things. Uh, first, fonts. a tale of fonts. Because you know what? Fonts, you never think about them. You don't. Mm -hmm. It doesn't run through your mind. You're like, ah, okay, there's a font. You see it on the web. It used to be a big issue. But, and, you know, fonts can make and break the complete look of something as simple as mm -hmm. like creating a title card. Even with my limited bit of design, if you're given enough fonts, I'm like, oh, geez, come on. Come on. That, what about that one? That one. Then you work your way down, work your way down, work your way down. Then then you just make it, you know, comic serif, like a real person. Like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> comic <laughs> sans. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I love the title of, the, of this article. It's Open Source Fonts Are Love Letters to the the, the Design Community. Oh, and that's clever. I absolutely see true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely true. And what's really nice is now you don't have to spend hundreds and even thousands to buy font packs like I have in the past for my classes. And this is great because since, you know, as an animation and graphics teacher since the early 90s, I've been tasked to find freeware fonts for my students to use. And now it is so much easier as those freeware fonts are now open sourced and more plentiful. And a result of open sourcing the fonts, of course, is greater variety, flexibility, and customization. You can customize the weight and the kerning. And I even have my stu students do a typography project where they have to make their fonts, their own fonts, or uh, adjust a pre-existing one that's uh, free or open source. And it's just, this is really wonderful. And, you know, Google was one of the first to open source um, their fonts and kind of the initiative for the moving from freeware, freeware to the open source paradigm. And actually one of my favorite font families is the Ubuntu font family. And they were one of the first to be open sourced. And that was really awesome. And even Adobe has some open source fonts. And uh, it's just, it's really great. And it saves our not only our students a lot of money, but the businesses and the community. And you get more variety as a result of it. So it's a win-win for everyone. Pedro, what's your favorite font? Mm -hmm. I like Droid Sans. What is uh, that? It is nice. It's yeah. a Google font. Mm -hmm. uh, it mm -hmm. was the default font for Android for a while. Then they changed to Roboto mm -hmm. and Roboto. Oh, I think it's Noto. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I like Droid Sans because it's like, oh, it's a really clean, non-serif font, obviously. And uh, it, it, it looks really nice. And it came out, it was open source around the time that I was in university. So basically from that point on, any reports, any like things that I had to hand in, print and hand in, droid sans all the things <laughs> what are your opinions on people who use custom fonts and terminals <laughs> whatever the default cool. mono spaced one for me but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a hell of a, uh, like gothic or something like what is this ah yeah the, the, i do yeah. see people with terminals with fonts that are i actually have to like Hard to read. What the hell is that? <laughs> I've done it. I, I've absolutely done it because I'll see something like, let's try that. Nope. 
Um, <laughs> that doesn't work with my simple, simple, simple mind. I think the default for um, KD Neon for the mono space is a uh, hack. Hmm. It's the hack mm. font. Yeah. They traditionally use whatever font is default. That one. That's good. Yeah. And if it's different between yeah, distributions, I, don't I, that I use one. that one. <laughs> yeah. The only thing I'll change in the fonts on the operating system is the um, aliasing. Mm. Because sometimes there are some LCD panels that if you do full aliasing, you get some rainbow. of the fonts look weird. Yeah. So I cut it's that back true. down sometimes. <laughs> Completely understandable. Mm -hmm. I did a thing. I took a challenge, man, because there's nothing, nothing more entertaining and spending $6 on eBay to see if something works, man. Uh, this is my little series that I'm just doing, a little side project uh, called Interfacing Linux. And this is where I'm testing out audio equipment on Linux. And I ran across this, man. It's kind of brilliant. This is a, what is it called? The new USB in and out interface cable converter mm -hmm. to PC music keyboard adapter cord. 100%. That's what it's called, man. And check it out. I mean, I looked at it. Oh, DIN connectors. I only yeah. wanted to know one thing. Mm -hmm. That one thing being is where did they source sparkly USB cables in 2020? I couldn't find any, man. I'm like, oh man, <laughs> this is this is like 2001. I wanted to go rewatch The Matrix when I saw these cables, but <laughs> I even searched the internet, couldn't find anything. So I decided to order a set of these silver music noodles in hopes that they can Linux. Um, and I have a couple of things to test them. That's my X touch compat right there, which has USB, but it also has hardware MIDI because that's kind of important. You might be plugging these into your keyboard or your control surface is seen here. And turns out they did mostly for the most part, they worked with a two J mitted and I was able to export the hardware. I test them with generic MIDI CC and I tested them over here with Mr. Mackey, and I, I would say about 97, completely usable, but you could see some things were a little screwy, but not enough to the point to where I could not recommend them and recommend them I did. They got a 4.25 right. out of five, you mm -hmm. know, mainly, mainly the nice. sparkles got them that extra two <laughs> five. They are cheaply made because these are 689 from eBay shipped. That's that shipping included in that price. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, okay. <laughs> and they're, they're made about as uh, quality as you would expect for six dollars and eighty nine cents. Mm -hmm. And uh, but they work, especially if you're using with a genetic generic. But we have a little bit of feedback on these, so stick around to the end of the show um, about the ins and outs mm -hmm. of the, the varieties apparently that you can get of these particular. All right. <laughs> But that's pretty cool. Go check that nonsense out. Uh, there's a another one I working on. What I call the Smurf box, which is back here. <laughs> you can't see it. I don't have lights on. But mainly because it's blue, and that mm -hmm. is an interface that I think is going to be a great pick for anyone who is just getting into podcasting or streaming. Not only will it save you save you a chunk of money, it is going to be dramatically better than the cheapest thing that you can currently buy that people are buying right now. So it's going to be a win-win. That uh, awesome. later today or tomorrow, I will have that up for patrons and you can have first crack at the ones that are available. That's kind of brilliant. Jill. Yeah. Before we get out of here, <laughs> we have another interview yeah. from scale where you talked to a human being and I assume, <laughs> I assume yes. we talk back to you. Yeah, so this was a wonderful interview I had with Kim McMahon, Director of Marketing for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is a works under the Linux Foundation umbrella, of course. So this this was really great, and it was really a, a joy to meet and talk with her. Okay, awesome. And I am here with Kim McMahon at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, a division of the Linux Foundation. And um, she's going to tell us um, information on how you can go about uh, learning um, to use the tools that the Cloud Native Foundation offers. Yep. Hi, Jill. Thank you. Uh, so, we, as you mentioned, we are part of the Linux Foundation, and we uh, provide we host open source projects. And what I'm finding at events like this and Open Source Summit is that we're getting a lot more people 
in the recent years who know what Kubernetes is and they want to know where to learn more. We have a lot of training tools on our website. We have free tools as well as uh, up to certification levels. And these are all offered through the Linux Foundation. We also have uh, free courses on edX. So people who are getting into Kubernetes, there's a lot of resources for them to learn more. We've also added courses, I know Prometheus and yeah. Maybe Envoy, but I and I don't quite remember. I should probably know exactly all the courses. And then another great learning tool we have that I direct people to is our webinar program. It's hugely popular. They are they're a combination of member webinars and project webinars, but uh, they when our members do the webinars, they do need to be about open source projects and they cannot be a marketing tool. So our webinar program is hugely popular for going out and wanting to learn maybe more about service mesh or serverless or, or things like that. You That's want your microphone? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful, Kim. Thank you so much. And I something really special here. Um, the Linux Foundation and the Cloud Native Foundation has sponsored and given a scholarship to the Linux Chicks of Los Angeles, my group, I'm a part of every year since OSS Summit 2017. And um, yeah, I've been to, every, every year I've gone to an event here in Los Angeles or San Diego, you know, here in California, and it's just, we've had such a wonderful time, and I got to meet Linus Torvalds, which was I heard it really excited yeah. and exciting and you know I got to talk to him about a half hour and that was a, a very very big deal yeah. and um, I went to the open networking summit twice and I saw Vint Cerf speak uh, wow. one of the fathers of the internet and that was oh really God, really amazing cool. yeah. Yeah. yeah so they have done so much for the community you guys have just done so much and I want to thank you too sure yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and just thank you so much for speaking with me, of <laughs> Kim. Of course, yeah. We are, um, yeah, I think we did, oh, oh, I had microphone. We, <laughs> um, yeah, we, we also do sponsorships for KubeCon uh, specifically, okay. and we've given out, uh, I think, over $300,000 to go to KubeCon. Um, so always look for those diversity scholarships. Should we stand next to each other? Yeah. Always look for those diversity scholarships. <laughs> and then um, Google School of Code, uh, uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation sponsors that, and trying to get um, the younger audiences interested in open source projects and yes. software. So, and I'm sure you're trying to do the same thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. You know, I teach computer animation and motion graphics, and I'm moving all my students to open source tools and Linux, yeah. you know, Blender, Krita, GIMP. So it's. Yeah, that area is exploding, yeah. oh, <laughs> and very and AI and cloud, and you know we talk about that all the time on Linux Weekly Daily Wednesday. Yeah. It's uh, one of our main themes, of course. Okay. So, anyways, I got to get going, but <laughs> thank, thank you so much for yeah, thanks so much for talking with me. <laughs> Hi, everybody, Yay. and we'll see you at the next show. Yes, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Okay. Thank you so much, Kim. Sure. Okay. That was pretty cool, man. Uh, do they normally come back like every year or? Jim? Oh, oh, the, the, <laughs> sorry. So yeah, uh, actually they, they have at the last three scales, they've mm -hmm. been at, at scale. And yeah, so this was, um, this is the first time that she came to scale though. So that was, was really awesome. I was just kind of looking through mm -hmm. that, man. Um, building yeah. sustainable ecosystems for cloud native software. So yeah. that was definitely something to check yeah. out. Yeah, Kubernetes and the like. <laughs> Good job. Good yeah. job. So we got to get into a slice of pie. Before we do that, we'd like to do a little bit of shameless self-promotion to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And if you want to join our motley crew of people that like to hang out, with each other the other seven days a week. You can do that by becoming one of our powerful Patreons, patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. Come on, button on the web zone, linuxgamecast.com. We have LibrePay. We have merch if you want to put us on your bodies. Good old fashioned PayPal. We have wish list for the studio and individually for Pedro, Jordan, and Jill. And we also accept mm -hmm. Bitcoin. That yeah. lets us do the show <laughs> ad free and all that fun stuff. I know a lot of people are at home sitting around and I noticed that because I made the mistake of pulling up 
a little number calculator for like last week's bandwidth, which was 186 <laughs> gigs that had already been sent out. <laughs> It's like, oh boy, it's going to be a busy month, but that definitely helps with that. But we like to give you, you know, first crack at early things that we're working on. You get a custom show. You don't even know about that. You like what we do. We do a pre-pre super mm -hmm. shows in every Saturday, which you get access to live, but also in podcast format. We do have the uncut versions in podcast form. If you need four hours of something to listen to during the week, you can have that. Um, what else do we have, Pedro? I know we have some other cool stuff. We do. Do you get uh, Discord access? You get, uh, of course, the um, show note contributions. You can totally go in there and basically comment on something we've said or submit your own stories, mm -hmm. which is uh, pretty amazing. And uh, of course, any of our Patreons, if we are playing a video game like we will be on Friday, uh, you'd like to join, you get first crack. Obviously, yeah. and it's going to be first come first serve on that because we don't know where the um, squirrely <laughs> limit is in this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like we learned with Meet the Freemans, squirrely limit was around six, and mm -hmm. then the game logic just went nope. So look forward to doing that. Thanks for letting us do this. This is kind of cool. It's a fun, interesting little adventure that we like Yay. to do each and every mm -hmm. week. But we need to get into. Just one slice of pie, not too much. Just this one week. slice. Yeah. Teeny tiny Dipa. little slice of pie this week. It's um plasma big screen turns your Raspberry Pi into a smart TV. It's like hold on. That okay. is the one thing that I'm <laughs> Okay, hang on, let me just get it. The monitor that I have and the monitor mm -hmm. that I get that shows like, I want one too, Steve. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. So <laughs> what they are is the what are they 43 inches correct 43 inch <laughs> uhd <laughs> monitors and i've sold people i'm like, they're like oh you got a big screen tv and i'm like no this is a monitor and i'm like wait mm -hmm. what I'm like yeah it doesn't have what what's built into it nothing they bought it for yeah. tv because people want <laughs> yeah. dumb tvs but yeah back, back to making a dumb tv more intelligent maybe Yes, making yeah. basically your own smart TV where you do actually have the control over the software. That bit, that bit I get, that bit I'm absolutely 120% behind. What I, what put a smile on my face the moment I read the uh, title of the article was KD running on a pie. And then if you read down a bit, it's like, oh, it offers uh, voice control support based on Mycroft. I was thoroughly awesome. amused by the choices of just about of everything that they uh, decided to pack in this. But yeah, plasma big screen. Uh, it is this one is going. I'm to going to be perfectly honest for the audio <laughs> listeners. The um, responsiveness of the UI is roughly that of a uh, Aha's take on me video. Mm. Yes. <laughs> just gonna be honest. You're getting twelve, yeah. maybe thirteen uh, hertz on that refresh. But yeah. It is very, very early days for Plasma Big Screen. Uh, I remember seeing like a couple of days ago on Twitter, uh, one of the KDE people was showing it off. It's like, that's a bit rough. <laughs> that, 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 that's a bit rough. And now they're slamming it on a pie. It's like, okay, it's a pie four. Sure, but it's still a pie. Come mm. on. <laughs> it's still cool. Yeah. I mean, homebrew. Yeah, no, uh, again, you said earlier, don't use Cody. Mm -hmm. Maybe use uh, Plasma Big Screen. Yeah. It may take some work to do some of the integration with the uh, rest of the stuff, but good work. <laughs> or buy a wireless yeah. keyboard and mouse like a normal person. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, KDE is, is running on, on mobile and actually quite stable, so it, it makes sense that it can run really well on a Raspberry Pi 4. So, you know, this this is a good option, actually. It <laughs> should be something to look yeah. at. Maybe you Two have pounds thoughts. off eBay. Two yes. pounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Buy one of those. How, how many time have you used that? Actually, several. Um, if yeah. for More some reason once. the... Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, for some hey, reason hey, the hey, Steam hey, Box hey, decides hey, to... Let me roll back. We've we, we got to put fighter points on this. 
used it mm-hmm. like outside of like, I need to use this or like, oh, here's the thing. And I just naturally reach for it. Oh, no, no, no. It's only on a strictly need to use basis. Like, yeah. like oh, I, I've really not good. <laughs> there was Let's an go. update to the firmware on the Steam box. And, and it's an emergency the device. speed reset mm. to uh, 2133. It's, it's like, why is everything running so <laughs> slow? Let me go into the BIOS quick. Ah, there we go. <laughs> okay, that, that, that's that's the equivalent of the keyboard mouse uh, monitor crash card. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. That, that is literally it. <laughs> but it's a great thing to have, though, right? Yep. Right. No, it, it is. It's like, I have, plug it in, turn I it on, done. <laughs> All right, that's really cool. Maybe you have a cool little device like that. You want to tell us about it? That'd be great. We'd love to hear about it. And there's a quick, easy, handy way to do that that only involves what? I mean, you can't really go outside anymore nowadays, but you can totally um, carry your pigeon, just attach a little USB with the video file that you recorded off your phone, and uh, send it our way. Or you can go to LinuxGameCast.com, you hit the contact button, make sure LWDW is the show that you're sending your feedback to, and fill out the form. It's pretty easy. Even a pigeon could do it. Pigeons Don't quote go me on Google. that. <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah, no. Let us know about Pi Project's weird devices that yeah. you managed to get working with Linux. Why not? Send us a question. Here's a good one. Yes. Yeah. Um, Wimpy wrote in. This we, is awesome. He, he tweeted at me. And hey, yeah. I, I understand my role in Linux. <laughs> like, I have a video problem. It's like, hmm, yep, I'm getting that. <laughs> Wimpress. It's like, yo, Vin, do you know of a Linux supported PCIe multi port? HDMI capture card that doesn't require the sale of my kidneys to afford it. Mm-hmm. I need 1080p 60. No UHD required. Two HDMI in is good enough. Well, 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 well. Mm-hmm. Turns out I do. I kind of do. Because I, I have my, my squiggly spooch is completely intact. I didn't have to sell it. And uh, I have a better solution. Because here, here's the unfortunate truth. The sad truth is... You know, if you need like a USB, like USB 3 HDMI, that's probably going to be good enough for like 99% of the people that want to do something. Those aren't terribly expensive, more like 100 bucks. As I've learned, um, if you start stacking more than one, then you run into infinite problems and they're very difficult to overcome. Then you start developing new dev rules and adding extra USB 3 cards and buying thread rippers. But, <laughs> but, 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 um, if you're looking for multi-input, you know, if you have like two inputs, three inputs, four inputs, you're down to two players. You are. Um, Blackmagic and Majewell. And they know it. How do I know they know yeah. it? Go look at the pricing <laughs> for anything with more than one port. Like, yeah. Can we make up? Yeah. What are you going to do? Go to the competition. Blackmagic's the budget option. And you're like, what? <laughs> you're like, oh, <laughs> oh, go look at Majewell pricing. Uh, Majewell, yeah. <laughs> but Majewell makes uh, broadcast grade stuff. I mean, if you have a Majewell card, Good on you. They, that piece of kit is designed to be cut on, put in a system, and left alone for its entire life cycle. Mm-hmm. So maybe that covers it. But uh, you're going to be looking for like a Major World Pro, I like um, 11080, or if you have the like the cheapest solution, if you do need this and you're at home and you're looking for, if you have a free M.2 slot, the 11530. It's an M.2 version with two HDMI ports, you know, and it comes with like a little breakout card and two cables. That's mm. the cheapest thing you can get, and that's still good to run you. Um, like new, that's gonna be like three hundred and eighty US, but you're probably looking at like two eighty, maybe three hundred pounds for doing that. Option B is the budget option, which costs more, but it's the budget option. This makes sense, trust me. It's the <laughs> Black Magic Deck Link Quad, which has four four K sixty UHD capture ports on it. Individual shows up. In Linux, as for, you know, you install the drivers. Still trying to get one. And by that, my, I don't know, maybe that's something we'll do with the stimulus check. I'll finally look like, shut up and just get it. Um, that's a great piece of kit, but that's still running you like 500 bucks. But that's also future proofing things a little bit. Plus, you yeah. get the ability to capture at UHD 3840 by 2160, which I think is nice. But um, I don't know where I was going with that. It, just uh, go for it. Get what you uh, 
Yeah, one of those two, so, basically. <laughs> that, yeah. Well, okay. What we ended up doing, what it, what I told uh, Wimpy was, what I found was a more economical solution, which has limited us, but it's gotten us through to this point. Like the next thing we're buying is that Black Magic Quad, is to buy individual deck link cards. Yeah. It's cheaper mm-hmm. because you can get the deck link uh, 4Ks, which they do 30, 40 by 21, 30, not 60. But they do 1080p60, which is we have one for Jill, we have one for Pedro, and I have one for my camera. And you can get those for like 100, you know, 80 to 100 dollars a piece used on eBay all day long. But yep. it also does bring it to the point of having a Threadripper motherboard with a gang of PCIe slots, too. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, because, mm-hmm. you know, I have four by 16 slots. I'm like, Unless you're Done. not doing anything with your GPU at the same time. Yeah, just take that out, put that down. I don't know how it's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> but just grab that lone by four PCIe GPU that you've had in your cupboard for a few years, put that in, and all of a sudden you have by eight available. <laughs> mm-hmm. Good deal. What's up next, Pedro? Up next, we have some. A midi madness mm-hmm. uh, relating to uh, that uh, bit of uh, a sparkly USB midi con- conversion that was happening earlier. <laughs> uh, YouTube's comment system isn't the most helpful. I'll mirror my comment here. Good job. Uh, those cables vary depending on how much the particular batch maker decided to pinch pennies. Yep. I have some that look identical externally and work fine, but I wound up getting a refund on another that didn't work. Since then, I've discovered an explanation of what was probably wrong, missing components, and a DIY fix. And uh, there's a bit of a link. I'm guessing it's his uh, his own blog. This is from No, I don't Stephanie. think it is. Is it? Oh, it isn't? No. <laughs> All right. Unless it is. So... I... See, guess how you cover yeah. your bases. A <laughs> uh, person on the blog, whether it is Stefan or not, figured out exactly what to solder and where. They also don't know how to do surface mount. Um, <laughs> no. no, I'm not throwing shade. <laughs> I'm throwing a little bit of shade. Um. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, uh, as it turns out, uh, if you wire in the aforementioned missing components all of a sudden it works much better go figure <laughs> i looked at it's this. like let's just skip a resistor here and a mm, diode here they're I, done I, I, <laughs> uh i mean that <laughs> listen you you can if it works it works that's all that matters i mean you know that's that, that's a, that's a uh that looks like a functional soldering job i'll give it that much mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Here's what I meant then. Um, for me, part of the adventure was, it was six bucks. I mean, come on. It's like, yeah. worst case scenario, <laughs> we're getting a video out of this somehow. I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't work. Don't buy it. Or, hey, look, it actually does something. And for $6. For me, I mean, this seems completely logical that there is a dance that there's varying degrees of quality because there's genuinely like 100 people selling these on eBay. That's why I linked it like, mm-hmm. this is the person I bought these from. And uh, it also happened to be the cheapest ones on eBay with shipping included. Yep. But I mean, most of them are free shipping. This was the cheapest <laughs> of those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, 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 truth in the title, the cheapest USB, whatever it was called on eBay. Um, it wasn't like a clickbait title at all. The time needed to implement this fix on a six dollar item i think i had just like drop the 20 quid and be like give me a real one yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you have to mm-hmm. value your own time accordingly well it's like time i forget the resistors or whatever we got and then we break up by the time we have to bring solder into the relationship i'm like yeah this is by the real thing this is uh i don't know but that's cool to know it might be a fun little sign project though so that's cool yeah yeah I mean, it, awesome. again, it's like six bucks if you torch it. Oops. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then it's a tinker toy, whether you like it or not, because you're not using <laughs> yeah. it for its intended purpose anymore. If you smoke it, try to fix it some more, you know? It's, if it still works, yeah. it's there's still room to be improved. Beautiful yeah. people, we're going to get out of here, but I want to thank each and every one of you for showing up and joining us live after the fact. Uh, we'll be on, we do have a YouTube channel, I believe. You can see us there and uh, download us on all the podcasting things for later enjoyment but let's roll the credits and thank the people yay 
<laughs> Who make it possible? Yes, yes. Yay! And yeah, no, um, every single one of you out there, thank you. Not just for making this show possible, but for sticking around you know, because I, I, yeah. I, I'm a little <laughs> sad. Keeping it going. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little sad that no one used one of the 3D Twitch emotes. A bunch of people right now just going to Twitch and like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> we got new emotes. Yay! <laughs> they got approved the same day, too, so somebody's bored. Oh, wow. That was yeah. quick. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, the volunteers we have approving the uh, things, they're all right on it. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! We love you. See you again next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.